Hello. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Stephanie Zaharek of Time Magazine, and this gentleman to my right, as you know, is Willem Dafoe. And Thank you. Um, he gives a, a really beautiful performance in a movie that um, I just, I think it's lovely. I've seen it twice. I'm going to see it again on the big screen <laughs> while I have a chance. Um, now, everybody knows something about Van Gogh. Like, we're his, you know, his paintings are almost part of our everyday life. They're on coffee cups. They're, you know, reproduced everywhere. And so we all think we have a pretty good idea of who he was, what his life was like. Um, but as this film shows us, I mean, some of it is factual and some of it is obviously imagined. Um, we don't really know him. So... Uh, how did you get involved in this project, and, and how did this film change your view of, of Van Gogh? Like everyone, I, I thought I knew about Van Gogh, and I knew some stuff, and some was true, some was bad information. Um, but I heard uh, Julian Schnabel, who I knew for many years, um, was thinking about making a movie about Vincent Van Gogh. And uh, I just... Uh, uh, I know him well enough that I said, what are you thinking about? And he said, I'm not sure I'm going to make this movie. I want to arrive at a script first. So he was working with Jean-Claude Carrière. And one of the things he asked me to do was read this biography of uh, A Life, uh, which is Knife, uh, uh, Whitesmith book. You know, the same guys that wrote the Pollock biography. And he said, go through that. It's a thick volume. And just pick out anything that interests you, any quotes or any events, just little details, anything. And I really enjoyed that. Now, keep in mind, he didn't ask me to do the movie. He didn't say anything about me playing Vincent van Gogh. I was just a friend that was doing something for fun and making some notes for this book. And I enjoyed it terrifically because the letters are quoted quite extensively in this book. The letters I had read before, but this time... Uh, it was more focused on uh, me reading them. They meant a great deal to me. Um, so I made some notes, and I gave them to him and Jean-Claude Carrier, and that was really the beginning of me feeling like I was part of the project. And then he called me over one day, and he still wasn't sure he was going to make the movie, and he said, come by, and he put on this really terrible fake beard on me, and uh, uh, Louise, uh, who also helped write the script and edit the movie and was a great help in the production and it helped Julian a great deal. She was there to take some pictures of me and uh, I think he had to arrive at some kind of image and he found that image and then it was really then that he said, would you like to do this? So that's, that's how I got involved and I knew I wanted to get involved because how beautiful Julian, who has a, such a relationship to Van Gogh, it's uh, something that he's been thinking about all his life, a painter making a film about a painter and about painting, that was very attractive. And just knowing Julian and how he works, he makes films like he works in the studio, so I felt like this is not going to be a traditional biopic. He's going to have very strong ideas, but he also works with what's around him. He works with what's in the room. He brings things into the room and then works with them. So I knew there would be also a degree of discovery as we were shooting. He had very clear ideas, but there was also a looseness. So that's a beautiful way to work. I like a strong, a strong vision, a strong director's vision, and then room to collaborate and room to um, invent things and find things besides uh, a strong structure. So. It's kind of like the ideal uh, situation. And then on top of that, the pleasure of having an expansive role like that and having the practical, uh, the pra practical task of learning how to paint was essential. And then on top of that, you had biographical information in these beautiful letters. So it was a very, it was a very rich uh, source to work with. 
Let's talk a little bit about the painting because one of the things that I love about this film is it's about painting as seeing and th this film really kind of helps you see the world as Van Gogh must have seen it. And also just the, um, the physicality of the actual painting. And I don't know if we guys, we uh, started talking through the credits as they were running, but the paintings are actually credited to Julian Schnabel and partly to you. So you were actually doing some of that. Can yes, you tell um, us? Um, uh, it was essential because as you see in the film, basically when you see, when you see painting in the film, that's me painting. There are no stunt painters used <laughs> in this movie. <laughs> And I had to learn, I mean, it was a practical thing. Also, how we were shooting, we were not shooting conventional coverage in, in the respect that we weren't like shooting a master and then going tighter for coverage. So it's not the kind of thing that you could sneak in or you could anticipate and edit and have him paint and then I'd go in there and hold the brush, you know? I really had to know how to paint. And it starts out simply by learning how to hold the brush, knowing your materials, he was a freak about keeping things very clean and ordered. He liked that. Um, and then how to touch the canvas, how to approach the canvas, how to make marks, how to make marks. And an accumulation of marks start to talk to each other and they become something. How to work, of course, color, but also the important thing, how to paint light. I think the biggest revelation was one day we were out, we'd go out sometimes and we'd just set up and we'd start to paint things. And one day we were painting some cypress trees, which of course was a very, um, was a popular uh, subject for uh, uh, Van Gogh, particularly in the drawings. But I was painting them in this case. And I was always trying to capture that cypress tree. Do, I mean, it's natural to do a good likeness of it. We're kind of moronically literal that way if you're not trained to see it. Van Gogh said, said don't, paint, um, don't paint what is there, paint what you see. <laughs> and when I was painting that tree, I was painting very fast and somehow I wasn't quite connecting with it. it was, uh, the results were very mediocre. And then Julian would say, slow down, now look, what do you see? And he'd say, look, you see that dark part? Paint in all the dark parts. You see that yellow? Paint all the yellow. It sounds a little like paint by numbers, doesn't it? <laughs> but anyway, he, he started to break it down, and I started to see a new way, and I started to see... It, it, it's not just about painting. It's about seeing everything uh, in terms of its origin and where it's going. It's rising and falling. And I think somewhere deeply, Van Gogh was seeing through things into the invisible, the things that are, aren't presenting themselves. He was, he was um, able to access, you know, when he was seeing stuff in nature, he was seeing uh, its relationship to everything. That's why when you see a Van Gogh painting, it invites you into its presentness. It really, now, painted centuries ago, it still feels present because of his treatment of light because he broke down that kind of attachment to seeing things, you know, in order, in function, only in terms that were comfortable for us. He was good at going past that, and that's why I think he's probably a great painter. I mean, I'm no art critic. Uh, if you brought the easel out right now, um, I don't know how well I'd paint, you know? But in the context of making this movie, it was thrilling to be addressing these things, and of course, then uh, to apply those things that you learn to the pretending, to the inviting to be changed and trying to leave your, your ideas behind and adopt new ones, it's very rich. And then on top of that, we're shooting in France in actual places that he was and sometimes actually seeing the same landscapes almost approximating his uh, perspective, literally. Like, he must have been standing here because you see it in the painting. It, it was a beautiful way to work. It was a great opportunity, and, you know, uh, it's nice to have, have a role, have a project that transforms you, changes how you see, changes how you think. And then, also, it being so experiential, you're with him. I'm with him, 
hopefully the audience is with him by the nature of how it's shot, how it's framed. Uh, Julian deals with it spatially, uh, visually, uh, with the messed up, uh, the di use of the diopter to f uh, fray the edges sometimes. That's, I think that's, he, he would tell you this, I don't know, I'm just guessing, but it's a way to throw you off your game, make you look a new way, it wakes you up. It's what Van Gogh was talking about, you know, talking about a reality that's better than the reality. He talked about Millet's sower is much more rich and has much more soul than someone working in a field. And he had respect for, <laughs> you know, working people. But the point, um, you know, it's a case for art. Uh, that's really what it is in the end. I actually wanted to ask you about the the diopter thing because there there are those um, you know point of view shots where they're really disorienting because you realize you're looking through someone's eyes and he's seeing things in a way that are, you know, um, it, is it true that um, that the director Julian Schnabel got a pair of sunglasses? Yes, that, and he, he loves to tell the cool. story. You tell it. I'm going to see if you know it the way <laughs> I do. Um, Apparently he was at a flea market or something, and he he found these old sunglasses. He's like, oh, cool sunglasses, and he bought them and he put them on, and he realized that they were bifocal, so <laughs> they just made everything look really funky, and so he brought them t to the DP, and said, can you kind of stick these on the lens so that we can get this weird disorienting effect? How how did I do? You did great. Okay. You did great. So <laughs> yeah, and then and then also he played with filters that way too. And and it was uh, it was a very uh, it was a very loose camera. Sometimes I even operated. Sometimes he he give me the camera, and I would be my own uh, subjective point of view. I was cool. One of my favorite scenes in the film is the scene where Van Gogh has already cut off his ear, and he's being quizzed by this doctor. And this doctor saying, "Well, you know, why did you do this?" And Van Gogh is saying, well, my friend left, and I thought if I cut off my ear, he would come back. Which is, uh, um, it's a strange bit of logic, and I think, you know, most of us, like, if we have our wits about us, we would say, well, that, that's kind of a weird answer. But the way you say those lines, it makes perfect sense. Like, it's, it's a completely valid explanation for why a person would cut off his ear. How did you approach that? I don't remember. <laughs> but thank you. But, but a, a reoccurring theme in, in uh, Van Gogh's letters, and also if you think about what he says, because some of, some of the text is invented, some is lifted from his letters. Um, he was very sincere. He was kind of without guile. He, he, you know, he, he tried to speak the truth all the time. He never was trying to uh, work anybody. Um, he was really a big truth seeker. He was haunted by this, you know, spiritual impulse. So I guess when I took those lines, I was I didn't question the logic of it. I didn't have to demonstrate anything. Um, it's I was I was down with him. I believed everything he said. <laughs> Because I was painting and I knew how difficult my life was. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I shouldn't. <laughs> no. Um, and then there's also that lovely scene where Van Gogh is in the hospital. And um, apparently it, it was a real, um, there were real patients around during the filming. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yes. Uh, Saint Remy. Uh, uh, the hospital he was at is now partly a museum, but it also uh, functions as a hospital. And much of it physically remains the same. It's quite beautiful. Um, and there are patients there, and the, the head doctor at the hospital thought it was perfectly, it was a good exercise for them to be involved in the film. So <laughs> they were. And uh, in that scene where Teo and I are in bed, all the people around us are patients. Um, so we had to be very patient, but uh, it helped to, uh, it helped guide us, you know? Uh, it helped guide us to be there in their world and taste their world, not try to, um, you know, impose a Hollywood world on them.
There's so much tenderness in that scene, um, you know, with uh, Rupert Friend, who plays Teo, who's just a really lovely performer. And that yes. moment between the two of you is just so... He, he, he was very generous. Um, you know, uh, it's a good start to get two men, you know, fully clothed, holding each other in bed, and that's a pretty good start. It's not a normal scene. Um, yeah, uh, Rupert was is he's a wonderful man and, and a very generous actor, so it was easy to play those scenes with him. And then uh, the stakes are very high because you're so surrounded by these very sick people. So it keeps you, you know, it's a slap in your face. It keeps you from um, thinking about other things or thinking what this is for. You really get on there. You really, um, you know, it helps you to find the tone, I think. Uh, the empathetic tone. Uh, it's easy to imagine being in that place and feeling like maybe you're the only sane one. Well, I think we have time for some audience questions, if you guys have any. I can't see very well, but... And a microphone is coming to you. Yay. <laughs> thank you. Um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for being here, I'm sure on behalf of all of us. Um, and then my question, because I, I feel like this story largely concerns itself with the sublime and this idea of, as an artist, mediating the sublime for an audience. Can people hear? Can it's you a really weird sound system. Yeah, oh. it's a really weird Should I talk Can closer? Can you hear me yeah, now? Maybe yeah, talk a little yeah, loud. Maybe I'm a little better. deaf. I had okay. To, I had to learn that lesson. I, did I just don't want to yell at everybody. <laughs> Is this yes, better no. for you? Yes. I'm okay, sorry. terrific. Um, so I feel like this film concerns itself largely with the sublime. Um, and I was curious about you know, your experience as an artist with doing what Van Gogh is doing or what he suggests he's doing, which is mediating his experience of the sublime for an audience. Um, and I'm so I'm curious about your experience of the sublime as an artist and also as being in the environments that for him uh, caused that sort of transcendent, sort of transcendentalist connection with nature. Um, and if you feel that while you're acting, and in particular, if you feel that, or if you felt that in those environments. If I understand, and if I heard properly, you know, there are, there are parallels, and I don't want to force those parallels, but I think, I mean, we all feel, we all have some sense. Actors get chance to practice it quite often, and it's what I always seek. It's, you know, to lose yourself in an action. To, it, it is through being in movement that you stop thinking. That relates very much to what he says about painting. He, he stops thinking. He feels in the swirl of it. He feels a part of something. He feels the rhythm, you know, the pulse of what life is, and he's entering, he's going towards something. In the best circumstances, that's what I feel when I'm performing. One of the challenges of performing is to find to cultivate that condition because so much conspires against that. Um, so I, you know, I don't want to force any uh, uh, comparisons because it becomes self-congratulatory, but the, uh, the process is similar. This sense of um, losing yourself to, f to find your relationship to all things. It's, it's like a spiritual impulse. We all have it. I think it for some it's a stronger need, some it's easier to manifest. But as a performer, th this is what keeps me going because it's that thing that you know is able for us to enter into the wonder of things. And I think that's that's what the light on the screen. That's why we come with a bunch of strangers to, together to to try to f you know find the. The, the magic, the invisible, the stuff that, uh, you know, we're not sure how it functions or if it functions. All the useless, great stuff. Actually, I have a question connected to that. Um, you know, obviously as a film critic, I believe in seeing films, 
big, because I like the image to be bigger than I am, but especially for actors, like the, one of the reasons I go to the movies is to see faces, like I like them big. Yeah. So how, I mean, obviously you probably like your face to be, <laughs> to be seen big. The bigger well, the better. But no, I mean, what, I don't know, what's your feeling about that? Because people can watch almost anything at home, you know, now. You know, size is one thing, but timing is something else. And, um, you know, the problem of watching stuff at home or when you can control it is you never submit to it. So you have, you can r resist it. You can, when it makes demands on you, you can uh, shy away from it. Where in a movie theater, the only option is to walk out. So I think you get your feet held to the fire and for difficult or, or really powerful movies, that's the way to see them in a movie theater with strangers um, because that's the way of committing. I mean, how many times have you watched something on, on, you know, on a screen at home or on your computer or something, and you keep on stopping watching it because you have other things to do? And it's just a different way of watching something, and it becomes so fragmented, it never, you really never give over to it. And if you don't give over to it, how do you expect for it to um, you know, work its magic on you? So I guess it's mostly about that, that uh, you've got to submit to an experience, you know, to be changed. If you're always controlling things, you're only going to go to your place of comfort and the place of what you know, and you'll never, you'll never be surprised. And that's, that's, you know, my pet peeve personally. I'm kind of spinning out, but that's my pet peeve about the false freedom of the Internet and all that. You feel like you can go anywhere you want, but you know what? You're going all the same places that other people go, and you're never really holding yourself to a kind of, um, you know, you're not approaching things that aren't made for just for you. You're approaching things, you know, you should be approaching things that aren't just made for you. They're made for everyone, and you've got to figure it out. I don't know whether that makes sense. <laughs> Good. Okay, back to you guys. Uh, you over there. Hi. Um, the scene. Can you hear me? It's, I'm maybe I'm deaf. Hold hold it really, really hold it really close. Okay. Like this, like almost, yeah. Um. So the scene when you're good when you're on the cliff and you're sort of curled up and the sun is on you and there I think if I remember correctly there were sort of tears in your eyes, um, and I would love to hear you speak about sort of those surges of emotion, um, whatever that might be that you felt, either filming or just thinking about Van Gogh, um, but I'm sure that they were powerful. Good. I'm not thinking about Van Gogh. <laughs> no, I'm not. I, I'm, I'm trying to be him, so how can I think about him? Um, I'm taking things from his life, and I, I'm respecting them. It's not like I'm running away from him, but I'm, I'm, it, can't, it makes me self-conscious. It makes me too, I don't know, it takes me away from things, from that thing that I talked about, about losing yourself in an action. Um, in that sequence, that's obviously improvised. It's not scripted. We found some landscape, and we were just having me be in the landscape, and I was you know, in a relationship with the camera. And the sun is going down. And I'm looking at the, the landscape. And there's nothing specific to do, but I was trying to be with nature. And I was moved because it was so beautiful. And that, f that camera frames, frames the activity in such a way that it turns the heat up on it. It's not that I'm giving a performance, it just makes it more concentrated. Um, and that's, that's powerful, that's the power you get from a camera. And it's not narcissism, it's really a focus, you know? It, it directs all your attention, it's like, you know, one point uh, concentration, it goes one place. And if you're contemplating nature and then you have this thing come to you 
that's a part of you by this point it's because you've been dancing with it and you aren't that aware of it. It's a part of you. Stuff happens. You're moved. You're moved by the beauty of things. And, and somehow I'm thinking, maybe I am thinking about Van Gogh. Maybe I'm thinking about uh, some things that I'm trying to paint. Maybe I'm thinking about some of the things that are in my head from what I'm reading. I am thinking about nature. But I'm not thinking about effect. So when I'm moved, I'm moved, you know. I'm, uh, the, the nature is working on me. I'm seeing something very powerful in nature then because I'm looking at it with, you know, with a painter's eye. Yeah. Trying. <laughs> uh, how about a few there in the blue? Um, probably not. <laughs> no, not because I don't love it, but I, I, I travel a lot and I like to work. And uh, my sense is that one of the beautiful things about being uh, in France and being in Arles particularly is I had a sense of place. And um, not only did I have a teacher with uh, uh, Julian and also a, a, a French painter that was painting a lot of the copies called Edith Badron, um, who's a painter in her own right, not only did I have those teachers that helped, you know, kind of structure things for me, but I had a spot. I had a place to work. And I like working in oil. I like working not huge, but fairly big. That's very hard to travel with this stuff, that sort of thing. So since I've made the movie, we've only made the movie, we were shooting this time last year, I think. So it's not that much time passed, but I've been really busy. So maybe I will return to it. I loved, I loved it. I loved to paint. And I must say, I painted before, but for in a much different way. I had to learn how to paint for a movie called To Live and Die in L.A. Oh. Um, but it, was a, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't a movie about painting. <laughs> it was a movie about counterfeiting and killing people. So uh, <laughs> I concentrated on that more. But I did like the painting, so... Uh, <laughs> For a little while, I was fooling around with painting, and then at the theater, when I would, uh, I used to work with uh, uh, my partner, and she was the director, and we were very close in that group, and and it would, sometimes it got very difficult, and we'd fight because we we were making original work; it wasn't easy. And and uh, when I uh, when we'd be fighting, sometimes she'd treat me like a little kid and say, "Go in the corner and paint." <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think we have time for one more. So let's go toward the back of the room maybe a little bit. Um, you can choose with the mic. Um, how did you feel when you played this role? Did you feel sad, happy, excited, angry? <laughs> um, I felt... Um, turned on, you know, because I was learning things. I felt excited. I felt, I, in, in my approach also, I, I, I was mostly dealing with the painting, but I was learning things. I was engaged in a way that you like to be engaged. So I guess it, there was more joy than pain. I, this movie, even though the character suffers and I felt like I was inhabiting him, I felt a connection to him, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.